to the uh, talk this afternoon. Before I start, uh, we have an uh, important seminar coming up on Wednesday, March 28th, that probably will be of interest to you and others. Uh, Dr. Brian Haynes from McMaster University is coming to talk about why not improve healthcare through effective knowledge translation. And uh, this is a uh, part of our Why Not series in celebration of the 50th year of the uh, uh, 50th anniversary of the University of Waterloo. Uh, Brian's done a lot of work in, uh, in information retrieval, particularly in how you get information into a form that physicians can actually act on it. Uh, I've heard him a number of times. He's an excellent speaker, and I think you'll enjoy the topic very much. Uh, today's speaker is uh, Ron Becker, and uh, it took us a, a significant effort to get uh, Ron here. We, uh, we, <laughs> we, uh, it's, it's about a yeah, year, I guess, we've tried. Uh, finally, we, uh, we found the secret solution, which uh, I'll show you at the end of the thing. We're on for at least 30 years now, which is horrifying for both of us. In Canada, through his work with the Dynamic Graphics Group, a very innovative, very active group at the University of Toronto, uh, that really uh, created some of the basics that are now, is now commonplace in graphics. And uh, I had the pleasure to work with him and uh, ha share students with him. We've supervised some students, uh, including Bill Reeves, uh, my only Academy Award winner. I don't know about you, but yeah. And uh, in fact, I think he got two Academy Awards ultimately, didn't he? at least one anyway, uh, which I guess is for artists, uh, the Nobel Prize of Art. Uh, the, uh, more recently, Ron is, uh, has created a network of centers of excellence called Nectar, which uh, I'm sure he'll uh, mention a few words about. And uh, we're looking to the potential of, of uh, working with Ron more closely. Already, this uh, seminar and many that we do is actually presented using the ePresence system that his group at KDMI in, in uh, Toronto uh, developed. So. The uh, e-presence capability is bringing us webcasting ability and in its newer incarnations, uh, web conferencing capability that we see as a dramatic improvement in the way we can offer educational programs and in the future be able to engage in long distance uh, collaborations among researchers and between professors and their students. So we see this as a key innovation in the future of both health and, uh, sorry, of, of both education and research. Uh, Ron, I welcome you. I'm looking forward to your presentation today. Uh, you originally called it cognitive prosthetics. I like that term because I need those. Welcome. Okay, thank you, Dominic. Um, despite the length of time and the various enticements Dominic um, offered to get me here, I'm sorry it took so long. I'm glad that it finally happened. And of course, I chose. Uh, you know, I timed this to coincide with some very good weather, so uh, it would be a, a very nice time to, to visit Waterloo. Um, the I'm here um, as a knowledge media designer, and I'm not going to try to define for you in any precise way what we mean by knowledge media. Um, Yesterday, I gave a talk in which I spoke about the ePresence system that we've developed to help people communicate, share information, and learn across distances. And as Dominic mentioned, that's part of a Canada-wide uh, research network. By Canada-wide, it doesn't mean it includes every major Canadian university, because it doesn't. It's focused at six sites, ranging from Halifax to Vancouver, that looks at collaboration technology, and that's uh, in the fourth year of a five year. It's not actually a network of center of excellence. I'm not that insane, but it's an NSERC research network, which is a much more manageable kind of project. Um, but what I want to talk to you about today is an area that I've uh, been starting to work on uh, over the last five years, and that's to help people with cognitive impairments of various kinds, helping them remember, think, remain mentally active, et cetera. And of course, when I talk about I do this, I mean, it's the royal I. There's a, a large team of talented people who do all the work. Uh, my, my job is to come up with visions that are uh, hard for them to realize. Um, yesterday, I spoke about ePresence Interactive Media. Uh, this talk is being webcast live. I asked the question yesterday and was a little chagrined to hear the answer. I'll ask it again today. Uh, how many people are online watching? Six. Six, yay, okay, we've doubled it from yesterday, good. 
Um, but uh, they will be captured and will be available essentially forever. Uh, come to th- uh, um, and so you can look around the world at various e-present systems, and there are some talks that have been viewed uh, thousands or tens of thousands of times. You see a variety of applications there. Uh, the one in the upper left was actually one we did uh, with Alex Haddad in Malaga, Spain, in which uh, Gorbachev was video conferenced between Moscow and uh, Malaga, and then that was webcast uh, around the world with e-presence and, and archived. And uh, um, if you want to learn more about e-presence, um, uh, look at the web archives. Uh, of course, uh, what I'm going to talk about today wouldn't be required if we were perfect. Okay, and you hear, you see here various images of perfection that come out of artists and designers, and uh, I'm not sure Superman is perfect, but uh, uh, that's at least uh, one image of uh, perfection or strength or power or something in the media. But we're not perfect. Uh, we get old, we get wrinkled, we get gray, we need hearing aids, we uh, wear glasses, in fact, many of us most of our lives. Uh, we need canes, et cetera, et cetera. And so uh, the talk today deals with human imperfection, uh, human imperfection in the cognitive sphere as opposed to the visual sphere or the auditory sphere, and comes in these pieces. I'll give a bit of background, then talk about the two projects where we've made the most headway, uh, one working with people with amnesia, and another project on multimedia biographies for people with Alzheimer's disease or mild cognitive impairment. I'll then step up work, uh, then talk about another project that we did, we've, uh, we are seeking funding for the Cognitive Recreation and Social Stimulation website, and finally some challenges and opportunities. And uh, I'm happy to take questions, but I've been encouraged because of the logistics of needing to pass the mic around that. Um, that we hold the questions to the end. Um, I'm happy to stick around past 3.30 to answer questions, and uh, my goal, despite the number of slides, is to, is to get done in about 40 minutes. So um, I got interested in that, I guess, in part because of advancing age, in part because it, it struck me that demographics was suggesting that there were going to be lots more uh, uh, cognitive impairments around. I apologize. Um, two versions of this course, of this lecture ago, I did it in the U.S. and I put in U.S. data. The Canadian data is that currently there's about 350,000 people with Alzheimer's disease, and that could triple over the next uh, 20 to 30 uh, or 40 years. Um, I read an article in the Globe and Mail recently that spoke about, I think it was the Rolling Stones, occasionally repeating a number because they forgot that they had done it earlier in the concert. Uh, I had the great pleasure to see Arlo Guthrie live uh, a few weeks ago, and Arlo Guthrie is only about 60, and yet at least eight times during his performance, he made some insecure comment about his uh, fading memory, et cetera, et cetera. So this is very much on our mind. The United Nations tells us that by 2050, uh, senior citizens will outnumber children, appropriately defined for the first time in our history, and even more staggeringly, they project that if the world lasts till 2150, one out of every three people. We're also looking at this because of technological opportunity. PDA shipped worldwide in 2005. Uh, by now, it's a, about a million, uh, a billion cell phones being shipped each year. The uh, technology of PDAs and communicators and cell phones is uh, rapidly merging. I'm pleased to see uh, friends from uh, uh, RIM here uh, today. Uh, processing gets cheaper and cheaper. I think MIT now admits that it's the $150 laptop, not the $100 laptop. Uh, I'm still not sure whether the notion that you have to hand crank it is a joke or is actually real. Uh, but the, the ambition is, is, is very exciting. Uh, storage costs almost nothing. Bandwidth is getting more and more ubiquitous. AI is starting to be uh, realer than it ever has in the 40 years of, uh, of exaggerated promises. I hope I don't uh, 
offend anyone from the field of AI here. And there is the vision of ubiquitous computing, which uh, although I'm personally very interested in, it looks to me almost like a technology in search of a killer application. And a lot of people seem to think that healthcare and medicine uh, is one area where Ubicomp will really become important. So uh, we've, uh, we name the storage device inside a computer as a memory and the notion of turning computer memory for human memory or more importantly human cognition is, is very interesting. Uh, of course, it doesn't have to be electronic. There are wonderful uh, memory aids and cognitive aids in the, in the non-electronic world. Uh, in the upper right, you see Post-its, one of uh, my favorite. Post-its, of course, was an invention that failed, yet was repurposed into an amazing uh, success. Uh, they're very cheap, although not as cheap as I'll imagine the profit margin that 3M is making on, on, on these devices. Uh, they're, um, you don't have to reboot them. You don't have to call a techie. Uh, I've, I now have a new pill dispenser, but I lived with that pill dispenser for a couple years. And I defy you, as you build software, to uh, break two of the containers of eight of your modules and have your software still run. Yet that pill dispenser still ran and, and worked. But nonetheless, we are trying to uh, use technology uh, as memory aids. Uh, the uh, Palm Trio, uh, I thought, was very interesting when it came out because it uh, really said, OK, we're going to uh, unify talking and organizing and connecting three very uh, almost different paradigms. Uh, there are uh, lots of special purpose devices being uh, developed, including RFID tags and GPS, all of which allow us to monitor and track uh, human behavior and human activities uh, in a far more microscopic way than ever before. Uh, can that help us in some way? And that's the uh, question. Uh, I distinguish in this work between three goals. And the first two categories I'm finding increasingly hard to draw a firm line between although usually I can look at something and say, yeah, that's primarily prosthetic or that's primarily rehab. Uh, prosthetic device is something that uh, helps you when uh, uh, something isn't working. So these glasses are a prosthetic device. They don't uh, permanently improve my memory, my, my vision, uh, but they help uh, compensate for the fact that uh, my vision is not Perfect, And you can imagine lots of compensatory or prosthetic devices for cognitive issues. And in fact, we use PDAs and calendars and post-it notes. Uh, very often, human beings to, um, uh, to help us compensate. Uh, who has not been in a relationship where at least one of the two parties relies upon the other party to uh, answer questions like, uh, where did I leave my glasses, or where did I leave my keys, et cetera. Or often they're mutually reinforcing uh, uh, prosthetics between the two people. Uh, more ambitiously, we can imagine uh, technology being rehabilitative, restorative. Uh, you know, If, for example, you had technology to help you with names, uh, would that uh, not only function as, OK, I can't remember the name, can you help me? But could it help you remember names, or at least a certain set of names, uh, better? As, for example, uh, cramming for exams, and, uh, uh, you know, which is a, essentially a rehab uh, kind of uh, procedure. And then finally, and this is in a way the most ambitious and the most controversial, is there anything we can do to prevent certain kinds of cognitive impairments? And this is particularly uh, uh, a notion that's in the public idea. I, with the so-called use it or lose it school, and keep your mind mentally active, and maybe you won't get Alzheimer's disease. Um, our process in doing all this is to try to understand some problems, some needs for some set of users, build prototypes, evaluate them, redesign, et cetera, and go. Uh, uh, along this wave of design and evaluation until we either have something that we can ship or run out of money or get bored or, 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 or whatever. So let me start then with uh, the project that we've worked on the longest. I conceived of this research program a little over five years ago, and this particular project started uh, about four and a half years ago uh, and deals with Asia. 
And what this means is that although uh, you've typically had uh, one of Brian Richards' clients, who's a teenager, in fact, uh, got his brain injury by being hit by a golf ball, and uh, I now am now a little more careful where I stand uh, when I'm on a golf course. Um, but the idea is that there has been a brain injury that means that you have difficulty or it's essentially impossible for you to form new memories, semantic memories, memories about facts, memories about appointments. Uh, you can still learn new procedures with a lot of training, and many of your memories from the distant past before the energy, uh, injury are still intact. Uh, an uh, individual named Dr. Brian Richards, who's a clinical psychologist at the Baycrest Center for Geriatric Care, started working with people with anterograde amnesia about 15 years ago, and after a couple years developed a physical memory book, and that's shown in the lower right here. And the idea of the physical memory book was it's a loose leaf notebook, and when you open it up, uh, you can add pages and move them around, and the pages are organized in half hour chunks, and it's a placeholder for putting appointments for the next day. And it is possible he was able to train his amnesic or amnestic uh, clients to record their appointments the night before, uh, set switches to go off at half hour intervals with that little electro electronic switch bar on the right. The switch bar fits inside the book. You close the book. You wake up the next day. You go along at 9 o'clock. An alarm goes off. You say, oh, I've got something to do. The alarm's annoying. I open up the book, turn off the alarm, read, OK, 9 o'clock, take your medication. 10 o'clock, walk the dog, et cetera, et cetera. And about five years ago, uh, Brian started uh, working with Palm Pilots uh, and better electronically. And uh, we got interested in this and working with Brian around that could be thought of as a point as technology for reminding. And in fact, there's a very successful, or at least it was successful uh, from a research point of view, I don't know whether it's still being used in practice, paging system developed by some clinicians in California called NeuroPage in which your caregivers or family members programmed the reminders for the next day and a paging system would go off and that would remind you to take your medication or whatever. And that uh, particular system was evaluated in a medium term uh, trial. It wasn't what medical people would call a clinical trial. The numbers were were far too small, but it was over 100, which is huge for the kinds of things we do, uh, that showed that it was very effective. And in fact, some of the effectiveness even uh, went on for several months after the technology was uh, taken away uh, from people. Uh, so Mike Wu, about four years ago, started a master's thesis. And uh, you'll see why I described the project in terms of the six bullet points uh, what he designed was aids for people with amnesia to help them orient themselves. And the goal was a prosthetic function, not a rehab function, not a preventative function. Uh, the technology was for the impaired individuals themselves. And I'll explain the distinction later. Uh, and it was Palm Pilot software. And he did it via a participatory design process. And the conjectured outcome was that this would give greater independence and self-confidence to the people with amnesia. Uh, in many cases, in most cases, these people have been unable to continue their profession. Many of them are very, very bright. There's judges, designers, programmers in Brian's clinical uh, practice. And in many cases, the burdens of caregiving have had a serious impact on a spouse as well. Um, and so what uh, Mike did was, uh, because when talking to Mike in the early days of his thesis, uh, I'm used to, as a knowledge media designer, I'm used to designing things where I can sort of comprehend what it's like to do it. I mean, I can't draw worth a damn, but I know what it's like to draw. So I was able to work on computer animation systems. Uh, I'm not a skilled typesetter, but I understand uh, typography, and so I was able to design uh, with Aaron Marcus uh, uh, programs to help uh, present computer program source code to make it more readable. But I couldn't imagine what it was like to have amnesia. So I said to Mike, let's do participatory design, designing with these individuals as design partners rather than uh, designing for users as is typically done in user-centered design. And of course, the challenge was 
um, uh, what to do about the fact that from one week to the next, the design partners wouldn't remember what they did. And so that was partly Mike's challenge. And through a variety of techniques, which are explained on the next slide, he was able to overcome this challenge. Now, what was he going to design? When you go into a participatory design session, uh, you can't have all the preconceptions that you do with normally user-centered design where we say, I want to build this. Uh, do you like it? Does it work for you, et cetera? And so, in fact, he threw open to the design team what it was that was of the greatest challenge or difficulty to them. And they came up with two things. Number one was what happens when we lose our Palm Pilot. Uh, and in two cases, uh, people had lost it and had severe psychological setbacks for several months, almost as if you had had a brain injury. Uh, and that didn't seem like a good master's thesis in computer science, at least I didn't know how to turn into one. The other thing was disoriented. I don't mean mildly disoriented like I am in this building, like not I'm going, but I mean seriously disoriented. I don't even know where I am or why I'm here uh, or who I'm with, or et cetera. All I know is that I'm lost, you know, capital L. And so uh, what Mike did was develop a set of methods, and these have been uh, published in the participatory design and Kai literature that involved uh, extreme structuring of the design process, a lot of review, a lot of documentation of the design history, taking detailed notes uh, during the design meetings, beaming them down to everybody's Palm Pilots so they could uh, review them before the next meeting, creating various kinds of environmental support, lots of use of uh, post-its and whiteboards and sketches and storyboards and things like that, uh, always meeting in the same place uh, that enabled the design team to successfully design a new application called the Orienting Tool. It's, uh, it's not, uh, you know, it's not uh, uh, the most sophisticated uh, programming uh, job. In fact, if you look at it, if you look at the upper right versus the lower right, the lower right shows how you would record a meeting uh, with the typical uh, Palm uh, uh, Daytimer software on the upper right you see. And about all that's been done is to pull out the things that are really salient for an individual who is confused or disoriented. Who, what, where, why, what's happening? And that's what it, uh, what it did. Uh, the amnesic clients were trained to use this, and Mike did a couple of evaluations, very short, mostly qualitative evalu evaluations, one in which he took amnesics to a shopping center and gave them a set of tasks and set them loose to, uh, to do it while somebody was sort of shadowing them to make sure that no disaster happened. Another uh, software home and used it, and the results were uh, reasonably, um, you know, not a, uh, not, um, I mean, if, if a clinical trial in medicine is the gold standard, uh, this was barely uh, a little bit of bronze or something like that. So, uh, uh, but the main contribution, I think, was the notion that you could do successful participatory design with a population that uh, you might have said at first glance, no, how can you do that? You know, then, and, and um, we've, we've carried on efforts in this, some successful, some not so successful since then. Uh, so one of the things that came out of Mike's work and Mike's uh, continued involvement in the uh, clinical situation of uh, the Baycrest Center for Geriatric Care is the notion that if you think about a prosthetic for someone with a serious cognitive impairment, uh, you don't want to think of this as just something that uh, an individual used, like this is my prosthetic for uh, keeping track of how I'm doing by time, although there's a very good timepiece there, but uh, uh, this is an atypical uh, lecture room. Most of the lecture rooms I go to, there's no timepiece, so I, I tend to carry this very lovely uh, prosthetic around. So that's something for me. I mean, it, uh, it's not intended for you. It's not a collaborative tool. But uh, individuals with amnesia collaborate with their caregivers, with their clinicians, with their spouses, with their children uh, on working together to combat the, dis combat the disability. And so we started to think that maybe we should think about memory aids not as individual prosthetics, but as collaboration technology. Now, this, this was something that I welcomed because it meant that I could fund um, uh, Mike under our Nectar <laughs> network for collaboration technology. And so what Mike's doing in his PhD is, first of all, um, 
unlike the first, unlike his master's thesis in which he had sort of half dozen people with amnesia, this time he actually went in and spent two to three days in the homes of people with amnesia, really watching everything that went on and taking detailed notes as, as detailed as possible. Analyzing this using grounded theory, and now he's actually in a design phase. He's already completed 12 or 13 one and a half hour design sessions with six people with amnesia, um, uh, trying to design what it is they want to help them deal with some of the larger issues of managing appointments and functioning as normally as they can that relate to how they interact with their caregivers. And that really, uh, the, the key issues are communication and coordination and scheduling. And uh, that's what, uh, what, 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 what's coming out of. Uh, the need for that came out of Mike's observations where he observed what he calls memory support networks at operation in these families. Uh, he observed information about things that you would have to do in the future, prospective memory, uh, working its way to current memory, I need to do it now, going back into retrospective memory, I did this yesterday. He uh, observed lots of use of various kinds of technology, cell phones, Palm Pilots, Post-its, wall calendars, refrigerator surfaces. And the question is, is there something you can do with technology to improve this? And the answer is, we don't know, but uh, that's what Mike's uh, PhD thesis is all about. Um, so the next project I'm going to talk about is um, very, very different. And this uh, started out as a project for people with Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease is very different from, and for some injury, your brain is, 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 is more or less permanent. Well, Alzheimer's disease is a degenerative disease when it starts to hit. Uh, your neurons get covered with plaques and tangles. Neuron, there's uh, more neuron death. And uh, this leads eventually to not only serious memory problems, but uh, physical um, uh, problems. And uh, it's really a, a kind of deterioration that, that is uh, not only very difficult for the individual, but hugely difficult for, for the family. And so um, we started to think about, was there a way to use multimedia technology to help the process Again, we're talking about a memory process, but now we're not talking about reminding people or finding your glasses. We're talking about reminiscing, remembering what it's like to have been married or what it's like uh, to have had the birth of a child or what it's like to have gone to university. And we were encouraged in doing this by uh, a number of things. For one thing, Elsa Marziali, who's my collaborator in this, who's a social work uh, prof at Baycrest and U of T had done a pilot project about four years ago uh, in which they did a 20-minute film that sort of recaptured a bit of the life history of a client at Baycrest. And this was uh, viewed very positively by the individual with Alzheimer's disease and by the family. Uh, we noted that the interest in genealogy uh, is increasing. Increasingly, you find more and more stuff on the web that uh, enables individuals and families to uh, reconstruct and document what was like in their past. And there's lots of technology around. I mentioned that storage costs essentially nothing. Uh, there's a very eminent uh, computer scientist named Gordon Bell who went to, was at DEC for many years and Carnegie Mellon and various things and then went to Microsoft about eight or nine years ago. He's built a system called My Life Bits and some poor uh, I assume you Stanford College student was paid for three years to digitize every piece of paper in Gordon's office. Uh, and uh, every phone call is recorded and the viewing of every video is recorded. And uh, I'm not sure what he's accomplishing with this now, but the, the question is, uh, it's now technologically feasible to have a digital record of your entire life. What, what, what does that mean? Uh, Microsoft Cambridge, England has developed something called the SenseCam. You see it on the lower left and some of the images on the lower center. And SenseCam, you, you wear it here and it snaps pictures automatically based on the passage of time, change of light levels, motion, temperature changes, et cetera. And it brings you a three or four minute flash frame uh, uh, 
history, episodic memory of what happened to you that day. Well, what do you do with that? Uh, Microsoft, uh, they've actually had one very interesting uh, individual with amnesia that they've followed for uh, close to a year now where this has made a huge difference in her ability to remember what happened in a particular day and also remember things that maybe didn't even happen in the particular day. So, uh, so it starts to look like a rehab technology and Dundee did a multimedia project called Circa that uh, was used for reminiscence therapy that allowed people with uh, Alzheimer's disease to encourage them to talk about life in Dundee because they could see pictures and videos and music. So uh, about three years ago, a, a, a wonderful master's thesis student of mine named Tara Cohane started working on this project. Happily, we actually did get some funding for this from the Alzheimer's Association in the US. And the, the idea was to create aids for reminiscing primarily compensatory, but possibly restorative. But uh, as the work has gone on, we've started to work 50-50, uh, mild cognitive impairment. The odds are uh, one in eight that you'll be diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease within a year, and one in two that you'll be diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease within uh, four to five years. Uh, and unlike the first pr project, we thought that this would be helpful not only for the individual with Alzheimer's disease in the family, uh, and my original concept was, okay, internet delivered multimedia, you could fly through this using any dimension. Uh, Tara brought me down to earth, we decided we would just publish um, uh, nonlinear uh, DVDs in which people could go through the, the, the multimedia. We uh, conjectured that this would help stimulate memories for the individual who's, uh, who could see their own biography that it might calm or reduce disruptive behavior. So far, we've not been able to get any evidence one way or another about that, and that it would be very, very positive for the family. Tara developed a framework in which he used uh, a um, theatrical metaphor, the acts of your life, and a film metaphor, the scenes within the acts, to structure this as basically a series of like an act might be adolescence, your university, your first marriage, your second marriage, your third marriage, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and scenes would be various things within that. Um, the uh, material would be organized and digitized, and this in some cases has proved to be relatively straightforward, and in other cases non-trivial to gather uh, various kinds of multimedia uh, multimedia uh, data, still pictures, movies, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we've, uh, we're just into, we're about halfway through the last year of the grant. We've had over two dozen referrals. About a dozen of them, after a meeting or two with our clinical coordinator, have uh, not been interested, usually because we required a, f a reasonable time commitment because we wanted the multimedia biography to be shown regularly every week to the person with Alzheimer's disease and it involved production time. In some cases, the disease was progressing fast enough that the family was just uh, overwhelmed. But we've actually had 14 participants. Only one is totally evaluated. Uh, two, uh, uh, in one case, the individual died halfway through the production process. In one case, the caregiver was not able to follow through, but we're anticipating by the end of this, sometime this fall, we'll have 12 complete cases, six with Alzheimer's and six with MCI. And what's been very gratifying, because I didn't want this to be something where you, you know, had to bring in a Hollywood-style production crew, is we've taken seven students, some undergraduate, some graduate students, some computer science, some social work, some history, political science, architecture. Not a one is a trained film person. One had some, learned some with his father who was a filmmaker. And they've been able to do this because of the state of the art of digital editing tools, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this is uh, uh, the woman we'll call Jenny. Uh, controlling the multimedia. One of the things Tira experimented with was different input devices. And uh, uh, this will show uh, Jenny watching her biography, her biography or part of it on the upper left, and you'll see her. Uh, she's actually using a wonderful little uh, trackball that Tira sewed into something soft and fuzzy that uh, Jenny could hold in her lap and control it. 
Uh, and so uh, I'll just run this. stage of the analysis up to a year with Jenny we've done we're now only doing six months of follow-up as we just don't have the time to do a year uh, we've done three months follow-ups with another three clients it looks like the biographies enjoy viewing their biography uh, it looks like uh, they um, are at least willing to view this repeatedly uh, we don't really have any sense of how much this is being really uh, strongly encouraged by their caregivers or family members or they really want to do this. It seems to help preserve a sense of identity. We don't know quite how to measure that. Uh, there's certainly evidence that it's stimulating memory of people, places, and events. I think you saw that in the video. Um, uh, group viewing seems to stimulate conversation between biographies and family members. Uh, the daughters of Jenny report that this uh, has led to occasional uh, very um, uh, rewarding interactions between Jenny and her grandchildren, uh, or great-grandchildren, I, no, I, I forget which. Uh, the uh, biography seems to help nurture and provide emotional support to the family members. The family members all seem very gratified and very happy with having worked on this. Uh, and uh, seems to help them better accept the Alzheimer's disease. And at least in Jenny's case, she's in a long-term care facility. Uh, the report is that some of her caregivers, who staff members there, have watched this, and now they have a sort of a better sense of who she is and not just another lady with Alzheimer's disease. Um, so uh, as we uh, continued with these uh, two projects, uh, we started thinking about is there a way to, uh, we now have a research framework um, on how I formulated uh, dimensions. One is what kind of cognition or often what kind of memory are we trying to uh, assist? Is it, uh, we've talked about uh, reminding technology or reminiscing technology. Uh, what about recognizing technology, helping you uh, remember people's names or recognize who they are? What about finding objects you've lost. Uh, I mentioned the second dimension, prosthetic versus rehab versus preventative. The third dimension is, uh, are you talking about a specific disease condition? Are you talking about a so-called normally aging individual? I guess we're all normally aging, but uh, we think of ourselves as normally aging, I guess, when we're uh, getting up in years. Uh, are we talking about just anybody? I mean, you don't have to be normally aging to uh, have memory problems. 
uh, who's actually the user? Is it for the individual with the cognitive impairment or is it the caregiver? Is it family members? Is it some team? What kinds of technology are we using and what kind of design approach are we using? So now I'm going to talk about a, a third project that was a master's thesis uh, that uh, started out to be uh, uh, one thing and turned into something different because of the way participatory design works. Um, the problem we wanted to tackle was the problem of remembering names. And we had some literature, and it's cited here. Uh, this is survey data that's about 15 years old now, uh, but I doubt it would be uh, much different now, in which uh, senior citizens, in one case, um, uh, average age 73, and one case, average age 62, complained about forgetting names as the thing that they found most frustrating, as opposed to misplacing objects or uh, forgetting appointments or things like that. Uh, and so uh, what could you do in terms of a name prosthesis? And uh, if you see, there's one there. I've got one here. Uh, our, uh, um, our, our PDAs, our Blackberries, our um, uh, Palm Plites, whatever, are, uh, all function as time prostheses. Uh, but uh, because uh, the concept of a name is much harder, we've had very little technology that really functions effectively as a name prosthesis. A address book is one, but um, it's uh, not as, uh, it's, it's, it's not all that useful. And so we started to think about could we, uh, could we design technology that are name prostheses? A number of people, including Steve Mann and, uh, at Toronto, you see Steve Mann and some of the cyborgs on the upper right, have been talking for a number of years about wearing wearable computers with head-mounted displays that could recognize uh, people and, and tell you in your heads-up display who it is, you're, um, uh, who it is who's approaching you. Uh, but as far as I can see in the research literature, uh, this has not actually been uh, developed and deployed on any, any large scale. Whenever I ask Steve about uh, what he's accomplished in this, he sends me the same three paragraphs he wrote 10 years ago. Uh, and so uh, uh, now uh, wearable displays are geekish, although ultimately they'll look more like what you see on the lower right. They will be very fashionable. Uh, but for the moment, we were not going to worry, worry about wearable computers. We thought about what could you do with cell phones. And so uh, Mike Massimi started to work uh, uh, with uh, a bunch of senior citizens. And what he wanted to do was design a name prosthesis for normally aging senior citizens that they could use on a cell phone. Because he used participatory design, he got into the meetings. And even though every one of these people had answered, they knew this was the project, as soon as they got there, they said, we don't care about names. We're old. We can get away with it. Our basic problem is that we can't use cell phones at all. You know, they're, they're, uh, it's, it's, it's a technology that's too much for us. So let's see what we could do about more basic uh, cell phone functionality. Now this, And so what Mike did, and uh, this was a collection of five uh, more or less randomly selected senior citizens aged 55 to 85. Uh, most of them had some computer experience. They were not, uh, they were not technophobic, uh, but they were having a lot of trouble. And so, uh, and so Mike's uh, master's thesis changed, and uh, I'm now a little more cautious about doing participatory design than I was before. And he was basically uh, not concerned with uh, name uh, recall, but concerned with the basic human factors of phones and the kinds of issues that these bunch of seniors, and you see here them uh, slightly fuzzy pictures, in uh, uh, design meetings in which, for example, in the lower right, you see them evaluating some phones, trying to decide what to, uh, uh, at the end, they chose something called the K-Jam, something or other, which I'd never heard of for because it was sort of the largest cell phone that they could find or something. And they were really concerned with tools for security, reminders, and contacts, sort of basic stuff that you use with PDAs and, uh, and cell phones. And so uh, one of the things that they came out with and is reported in Mike's thesis is that uh, independent of actually the detailed design of some of the software apps that could run on a cell phone, uh, some of the things that most concerned them were things that, again, Mike couldn't solve in a master's thesis in computer science. They were really hardware issues in the design of the phone. Large buttons, large screens, zoomable text, 
high quality instructions. Well, that you could solve, but one touch emergency bus button, speaker volume so you can hear depending on where the environment you're in. And there are now are some phones coming out. Um, uh, what you see here, uh, the one on the upper left is the silver phone, is a British phone. It seems very limited in fu functionality. It basically has uh, five buttons that uh, can be programmed for different commands. And then Samsung now has actually come up with something called the Jitterbug, which has uh, phones that are specifically designed for, for senior citizens. The one in the lower right uh, has basically three buttons, and they all deal with emergency. Uh, an operator, a tow, a 911. That almost seems a little... Uh, redundant, but um, at any rate, there there is um, uh, interest in that. And what also Mike came out of his master's thesis was uh, some of the pragmatic criterion that you would need if, in fact, you wanted to continue to do participatory design. And I think participatory design is still a good thing, but you have to have realistic expectations of what happens when you give power to uh, your clients in this way. And so uh, some of these design guidelines, I don't have time to go into it, they're, they're, they appear in Mike's thesis, um, uh, came out of this. Uh, one really trivial thing was reimburse early and option. If uh, it's, That shouldn't be option, reimburse early and, op and often. <laughs> um, uh, uh, because you're a senior citizen, even five dollars for a TTC fare is a big deal, and if you, you know, you better uh, give them the money right away, and and uh, things like that. As well as the hardest thing was the fact that every one of these individuals, or almost everyone, had some physical inner impairment that was uh, confounding the cognitive impairments. One person had very poor visibility. One person could barely hear. One person had hand tremors. So the design space is very, very, very challenging. Uh, we've defined, uh, this, is also, this is out for review. Uh, we're hopeful it'll get funded. We uh, have defined a set of projects that go under the name Wise Guys to get back to the name problem. And this in includes a, the context of where a cell phone that I was actually hoping Mike would build a dynamic picture frame and some work on head-mounted displays and automatic recognition a la Steve Mann, but uh, we don't know whether uh, this is gonna get funded. Uh, the last project that I'm gonna talk to you about uh, is one that is also uh, unfunded that we have a grant proposal at, and this deals with the Use It or Lose It school. And uh, Use It or Lose It is uh, a phrase that's out there, the idea is you know, if you do lots of crossword puzzles, if you uh, uh, read a lot of books, if you, uh, uh, play, you know, uh, play Sudoku puzzle, do Sudoku, et cetera, you will prevent uh, cognitive decline, you will delay the onset of Alzheimer's disease. In the, in the most extreme form of the, the dream, you know, you won't get Alzheimer's disease or you'll delay it 10 or uh, 20 years. Uh, this is very, very controversial, although there are many companies jumping on the bandwagon. Nintendo has uh, a new game or collection of games called Brain Aids. They supposedly sold uh, three million of them in the first three months. Their websites now, companies, Posit Science, Happy Neuron. Uh, I get sent uh, a URL of a website every month. Uh, there, uh, are increasing experiments on animals, on rats, on various other creatures that say that brain, the brain is more plastic in as we uh, get older than we had thought it was, and that uh, you should be able to uh, take a brain of a senior citizen or someone almost senior citizen and make significant changes. And yet, uh, this is very controversial. On the one side, uh, there's a concept called cognitive reserve, which has been uh, written about a great deal uh, by Jakob Stern, who's the uh, neuropsychologist that visited Columbia Medical School. And uh, uh, Jakob has postulated the term cognitive reserve to account for the fact that you can take two senior citizens and do functional MRI scans or other brain scans on them and it looks like they have identical pathologies. You can see signs of plaques 
and tangles and things like that. And yet one of them uh, seems to have Alzheimer's disease, has a lot of memory problems, has problems in executive functioning, et cetera, and the other one does not seem to have Alzheimer's disease. And they correlate the difference based on uh, aspects of your life history, like people who have had higher education uh, have uh, greater cognitive reserve. People who have had more challenging jobs have higher cognitive reserve. Uh, people who have had bilingual experiences early in life seem to have greater cognitive reserve. Uh, Nicholas Garmaeus, who was across the hall from me at Columbia, believes that people who live on the Mediterranean diet have higher cognitive reserve. Uh, uh, and you can find lots of correlations between uh, uh, experiences over your lifetime and higher cognitive reserve and greater resilience to uh, what Yaakov calls the yet a number of co cognitive neuroscientists say uh, well you can't be from lifelong activity and uh, there's no convincing evidence that uh, if you start doing crossword puzzles at age 60 this is going to make any difference. Uh, one of the most skeptical articles was written by Timothy Salthouse, a uh, very eminent uh, cognitive psychologist, and after 15 pages of basically saying, you know, there's no positive evidence or very little positive evidence, he says, look, people then come to me and say, should I do this? Okay, should I play, do crossword puzzles? Should I? And he says, well, yeah, if you enjoy crossword puzzles, do crossword puzzles. Uh, it, it doesn't look like it has any harm. We may have stronger evidence someday. Um, uh, you know, so do it. So what we want to do in the project uh, we've defined, and we've already been turned down by one granting agency, we're now at granting agency number two, is we want to build a gaming website. We really think that, uh, in a way, Nintendo has the right idea that games uh, uh, can be valuable in this way. But why create a lot of new games? Let's leverage people's skills and interest and background in the games and the puzzles that they're already used to. Things like crossword puzzles, uh, Sudoku, uh, Boggle, Texas Hold'em Poker. Uh, and uh, let's build a website that's really designed for senior citizens uh, where uh, it's not too busy. It's not designed for, for teenagers, which is the way most games are designed. The text is not too small. Uh, uh, there's room for social interaction, community, there's adequate feedback. And so uh, the project we call a Website for Cognitive Recreation and Social Stimulation, the idea is to improve your cognitive performance. It's a preventative goal. It's very ambitious. With normally aging senior citizens, uh, and uh, we're not going to do participatory design. I know what I want to build. We're going to do a user-centered design process. And the outcome is that we can increase cognitive reserve and decrease mental aging uh, with this gaming website. And this was a first attempt to prototype. This is uh, the game Boggle. Um, uh, uh, we actually have a very limping implementation of something like this. Uh, and uh, the idea is to give you a lot of control about the complexity of the game, the timing, the method of scoring, whether you're doing it competitively or collaboratively. And we actually want to be able to run controlled experiments, uh, prospective experiments in which we divide relatively large numbers of senior citizens into random groups and we get them to do significant amount of gaming and we actually measure uh, what their, this happens to their performance. Uh, so we're excited about this despite uh, difficulties so far in getting it funded. Uh, this is, again, a summary of the four projects I spoke about at length uh, in terms of the framework. And I won't go through the detail, but you can see um, the, the different applications in the first row, the motivation compensatory in the second row, who the clients are, um, uh, going all the way down to the uh, design process. Uh, we believe the framework is uh, helpful. We're in the process of uh, continuing to try to expand it and apply it to other pieces of work done in the area. Uh, there are many challenges to this work. Uh, I've already mentioned the interaction of cognitive and physical impairments, the need to make tools like this easily adaptable by caregivers, family, and clinicians. 
uh, deploying this in real home and community settings, proving the effectiveness and very, in a way, very scary for me seeing the standards of evidence out of things like drug trials. I mean, when are we ever going to take cognitive prosthetics and be able to expose them to thousands of individuals before they're applied. I mean, how do we ever get approval for any of this from the Food and Drug Administration or um, various other agencies in order, to, uh, in, in order to do this? Or do we just let the marketplace uh, handle it without permission? Uh, recruiting participants is a challenge. Uh, training people to work in this area is a real challenge. Uh, and I'll conclude with just mentioning a couple, one project, other project that we've just started. Uh, it's called the Semantic Acquisition Machine, and it's another project jointly with Brian Richards and uh, Kelly Murphy and Eva Svoboda at Baycrest. And it uh, looks at uh, what you can do to help people who are worried about their memory. In this case, we're dealing with people with mild cognitive impairment to give them a tool for rehearsing facts and recalling facts. And we call this, uh, they call it the semantic acquisition machine. That project is, is underway. Uh, and I have a variety of other projects that have been, uh, are sort of gleams in my eye that I really won't, uh, won't get into. They're mentioned at the bottom of that. So uh, I've gone on a bit, uh, a bit longer than I wanted. Uh, I'm happy to take questions. And uh, thanks for your attention. Microphone to you, and uh, if you have any qu questions or comments, we'd welcome them. Any from you? Yeah. Yes, the uh, one of the things that uh, was on the news recently relates to this issue of uh, this, and that is a woman who had some serious uh, either stroke or brain injury. I don't work through the injury by practicing the skill, mental skill, cognitive skill that she had lost. And it was incredibly impressive. So you know, whether that's uh, due to recruitment of additional neurons or uh, new neurons growing in the brain or what, there is some evidence that this actually can have an effect, that you can blow through these and uh, reconstruct your memory. People use tricks themselves, uh, of memory tricks to do it. Uh, are you going to look into the, that research, or where are you on that type we, of work? We hope to look into the research. We, as I say, that um, we, we're, we're looking for funding. I mean, we don't have uh, we don't have funding to really do this. I, I'm also recruiting students. If there are any bright undergraduates here looking for grad school opportunities, uh, keep us in mind. Um, uh, I think I have one or two grad students, I hope, starting in the fall, once the offers go out, if they accept it, who might work on this uh, cognitive recreation site. And uh, we're really hoping to do this. Uh, the, one of the people who's really been most influential to me in thinking about this, or very influential, is a man named Elliot Cole, who's had for 20 years something called the Institute for Cognitive Prosthetics in actually Philadelphia, it turns out. And, uh, uh, he, unfortunately, he's published relatively little. He's published a half dozen papers, and he hasn't kept, as far as I can see, systematic records, or at least extracted systematic records. But he's worked with 100 clients over uh, 15 years or so, people with severe cognitive impairments, learning disabilities, traumatic brain injury, et cetera, et cetera, looking for what he calls islands of ability in seas of dis. He, he works with them, but this is this is very expensive, and it's almost like one therapist slash computer scientist working with one patient. And uh, the the issue is how do we how do we make these tools more reusable, and how do we train more more people to do this? And uh, I think we've, uh, as a profession, done a very very bad job of that so far. And Elliot is personally very discouraged because he feels the OT and PT communities haven't picked up on the importance of what he's done. Now, there's other work going on at uh, Toronto related to this. We had a, a presentation from Alex Michalidis. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, 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 Pupar here is working on that as well, um, Pascal Pupar. Uh, I presume, and I saw that in the, in the Globe and Mail yeah. just this week. Uh, do you work with them? I mean, well, we, we've talked to them. I've spoken at Alex's group. 
He's spoken in my group. Uh, we were both funded out of the same program from the Alzheimer's Association, uh, and we're looking for things to do together. His, his approach is more, uh, more prosthetic. Uh, I'm, I'm more focusing toward, towards rehab, and also we tend to work on somewhat different problems. Although he is talking about cognitive assistance, he's talking about cognitive assistance more for physical uh, actions and issues like washing your hands uh, or not falling down the stairs or things like that, whereas I'm talking more about aids to cognitive things. But uh, I, I, I think he's a very impressive researcher and doing, you know, doing very well for, uh, uh, you know, I wish I was his, his age and could be starting this at, you know, with as many good years as he's going to have. So, yeah, he's, he's very impressive. Any other comments or questions? Uh, Tom? I'm supposed to act as Dominic's prosthetic device here, as a matter of fact, but he seemed to remember it all by himself, so he's okay. <laughs> uh, so my impression of what you've done, you haven't really done any trials. You've done more, it's more observational. Uh, this looks like it might work kind of thing. Is that, is that a fair statement? That's a, that's a fair statement, and we don't know. Well, the first project, the only project thus far where um, we've proposed a more substantive trial is for the context to wear a cell phone to help people remember names. We've actually proposed working with, um, I think, 20 uh, participants with sort of an ABA design where you introduce the technology and then you take it away. Uh, this uh, Barbara Wilson in Cambridge, England, did that very well with NeuroPage on 120 people. With the, uh, the, the gaming website that I want to build, build together with Yakov, we propose to do a randomized controlled trial on 250 people. And one of the reviewers who uh, snidely tore apart our grant proposal um, and got us our first rejection uh, basically said, well, you can't, you can't teach 250 people to play games on the internet. I mean, what world is this reviewer living in? I mean, there are millions of senior citizens playing games on the internet. I mean, it's, it's ludicrous. So uh, we've got a real, there's a real cultural gap and, and paradigm gap between what we're trying to do here and, and medical science. And I need to talk more to people in the rehab field to see how, how they do it. I mean, Alex, Alex M., I mean, he's been able to try this on 20 people. Now, how are permission to introduce an automated uh, bathroom based on trials with, or 20,000 like a drug? So, so what's the right paradigm for, for, for this kind of thing? I mean, what, uh, I mean there, are probably, there are probably examples that I just don't know about. Like, uh, I mean, did anyone ever get, do clinical trials on a crutch before it was introduced? Or did people just start selling crutches <laughs> in the marketplace and people bought them? So, uh, prevents one from introducing this, for example, in new housing or uh, as part of a program. There's absolutely nothing. Yeah. Uh, there, there may be issues of regulation if there is a patient dependent on them and the patient could get lost yeah. using the device because it failed while, you know, you're putting them in danger that they wouldn't be in, in other words. Yeah. But a lot of this can be just tried. I mean, yeah. uh, the market can take it up. People will buy it. So mm. the clinical trial area is where the device it might interfere with a person's uh, safety yeah. uh, or create a, an unsafe environment is another way of saying that, I suppose. Yeah. You, know, well, you don't have to do clinical trials. You just have to convince people that they're purchase, they should purchase Well, okay, but, but again, taking Alex's uh, automated washroom. Okay, let's say that in fact, there's one chance in 1,000 or one chance in 10,000 that uh, um, your, your, uh, your AI program or even one in a hundred that is going to follow up. Okay, so uh, there is some potential danger there. You've taken your, uh, um, you know, you've taken your 88-year-old uh, father with Alzheimer's disease to the washroom and maybe in fact uh, something will go wrong while they watch the hands. What's the danger? The, 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 the comparison is uh, you, the caregiver, have to take the person into the washroom every time. What do we make those trade-offs? And it, it uh, isn't, 
Yeah, the issue wouldn't be that. The issue that would be concerned is how do you get there's nothing that yeah. stops you. Well, yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah. people might in, implement that in a senior's home, either at their own expense or as part of the building of the room. We know of, of other environments. Uh, we were at Elite Care in uh, Portland, Oregon area. And they have uh, monitoring devices on the patient's RFID tags and all that. And they've cut the number of caregivers, professional caregivers in this case, uh, necessary to care for those patients by having those devices. Now, they probably have to be careful about that in the sense that if a patient were able to wander who cannot now wander, but, the, but again, the issue is only can you convince people who built those homes to put the extra $10,000 per unit in? There's no regulatory boundary on that. Mm -hmm. So it's going to what you're trying to prove uh, or, or the danger you might put someone in. I agree with you that Alex's work doesn't seem to put people in any danger at all. I just want to mention if you're interested in this topic, sorry. This mic on. Uh, they are already marketing games, electronic games, to exercise the brain, uh, aimed at uh, the seniors' market. Oh yeah, no, no, they're they're happy neuron and positive science, and there's one new one every month. Yeah. They so. might see the FDA might interfere there if you if you make claims about that game, but mm -hmm. if you say it's a game and you know it might uh, improve your memory, I mean, look on television, you can get to buy a bracelet that's supposed to make you a superhuman person to play tennis you know, as some rays that we've never heard of before. As long as you have careful about the claims that you make, it shouldn't be a problem. What I want to mention is if you're interested in this topic, in a, as soon as we can reconstruct the time, Ann Pittock is going to be presenting on uh, some work that she's done related to the ability to prevent or regress uh, cognitive disorders and memory disorders. So unfortunately, the fire alarm uh, did her in the last time uh, that she was going to present. Any other final comments or questions from anyone? I want to make sure I don't. Uh, I, Don, uh, Ron has now done the, qu uh, the uh, uh, pro quo, so I have to give you the quid. Uh, <laughs> British terms, that's, uh, uh, he demanded, absolutely demanded, uh, in order to come here, an excellent scotch. Uh, so well, thank I didn't, you very I, much. I, I didn't quite demand, but. Uh, but it would seem like a demand but, at the time. But, <laughs> thank you very right, much. Thank you. You've got a few minutes to talk with people. I've got a few minutes, then I want to meet with uh, Dave and Greg. For